Anglo-Australians' opposition to Indigenous recognition would recede if the Indigenous movement took the nation's interests into account. Australia has two historic peoples, Indigenous and Anglos, both worthy of recognition, whether in the Constitution, in legislation or in educational curricula. If the Constitution is to be amended to afford recognition to Australia's founding peoples, it is appropriate that both Indigenous and Anglo-Australians be recognised. At present, Indigenous peoples are shown sympathy, while Anglo history and behaviour are often vilified. If Australia's origins are to be recognised in the Constitution, the people who largely created the nation and the Commonwealth cannot be omitted. If, as Prime Minister Anthony Albanese puts it, the fullness of our history is to be recognised, Anglos cannot be left out. Failing that basic standard of fairness and truth-telling, recognising Indigenous people alone will divide our society. Recognition must be conferred on both or neither. At the minimum, any Indigenous voice should be formulated in consultation with all major stakeholders, especially both of Australia's ancestral peoples. Consideration of the legitimate interests of Anglo-Australians recommends rejecting the proposal of a constitutional voice. The same considerations yield sympathy for Indigenous aspirations for recognition. Those positions can be described by four non-negotiable conditions. The first condition is that a voice will not compromise national security, national territory or cohesion. Therefore, a voice or other constitutional or legislative recognition must not empower the separatist revanchist nationalism advocated by anglophobic elites. Secondly, a special case of the first condition is that recognition or autonomy must not result in independent policies concerning foreign affairs or immigration. Thirdly, recognition must not weaken the nation's influence on the Commonwealth, for example, by impeding its efforts to eliminate anglophobic policies. Finally, Recognition must not compromise Australia's system of government. Let us consider these in turn. For the sake of national security, whether one sees the First Fleet and subsequent British settlements as an invasion or annexation, it is now imperative for the nation and the state and their dependents that Australia remain whole and undivided. The nation can allow for symbolic access to land such as provided for by the High Court's Mabo decision. It can continue to allow for and contribute to the cost of preserving religious sites and other special needs, linguistic, cultural, medical, economic, educational and social, to facilitate Indigenous cultural continuity and ameliorate disability. However, no act of reconciliation should be allowed to threaten national continuity, unity or identity. Any attempt to split off territory or otherwise weaken or dispossess the nation is unacceptable. That includes attempts to vilify or diminish the demographic standing of Anglo-Australians. This principle applies to foreign affairs. Australia must settle Indigenous grievances and minority assertiveness in general, or it will be less able to navigate the hazardous regional environment that is coming in the near future. Like America, Australia possesses the huge strategic advantage of being a coast-to-coast -coast continental country with no adjacent threatening powers. Being unimpeded by a home front frees us to engage at will far from our shores. Both countries are in the process of neutralising that advantage through imprudent race relations compounded by indiscriminate mass immigration. In both cases, the root cause is a political class whose immigration policies resemble those of a quizzling regime more than of a loyal democratic leadership. The United States could very well withdraw from world engagement due to economic mismanagement and metastasizing ethno-cultural diversity. With this in mind, Australia needs to present China and India with a united posture or we risk being absorbed into their strategic demographic spheres. Politicians on both sides of politics have been turning a blind eye to Aboriginal separatism. Anglo-Australians are unlikely to accept this forever, especially if their advocates gain representation in the political system. Criticisms of Indigenous separatism are already being made by at least one minor party, led by Pauline Hanson. She asserts that the exponents of a voice, quote, want an independent race-based black state, unquote. 
This criticism was also enunciated by Keith Winshuttle in his 2016 book, The Breakup of Australia, The Real Agenda Behind Aboriginal Recognition. This reaction could grow to become a powerful force impeding reconciliation. If this is to be avoided, then individuals who affiliate with the anglophobic multicultural establishment should be rejected as negotiation partners. Also unacceptable on the part of an emerging Indigenous state would be such an entity adopting its own foreign or immigration policies or asserting the degree of independence necessary to enact those policies. The states are already effectively prevented by Section 61 of the Constitution from conducting foreign policy. Neither may states raise armed forces without permission of the Commonwealth, Section 114. Collective agreement with these principles is therefore a necessary Indigenous contribution to reconciliation. Anglo-Australians look to the Indigenous rights movement to acknowledge that they are part of the Australian nation and that national sovereignty entails the Commonwealth's monopoly of foreign affairs and military powers. The Commonwealth and its Parliament must remain united and the supreme policy-making body. Thirdly, no act of reconciliation should impede the nation from reclaiming democratic control of the institutions of government. Maintaining democratic control is important because common sense and events of recent decades reveal that a rogue commonwealth can and has become the vehicle of those who are not attached to the nation's identity or continuity. To reiterate from an earlier video, state refers to the governmental component of what is sometimes called the political establishment or deep state, the federal and state governments, including the senior bureaucracy, public broadcasting, universities and other senior sections of the educational system. Too often, elements of the state apparatus act against fundamental national interests. This is unacceptable. The Commonwealth must not attack the nation that created it. Anglophobia, like other forms of racism, is unpleasant and divisive. In an Anglo core nation, it is seditious. More broadly, a voice or other forms of recognition must not exploit or otherwise unfairly disadvantage non-Indigenous citizens. The fourth non-negotiable condition is that recognition should not degrade governance. It is tempting to argue that fairness requires equivalent recognition of Anglo-Australia, but fairness does not equate with feasibility. An Anglo voice fashioned along the lines proposed for Indigenous Australians would undermine our system of representative democracy. The imperatives of parliamentary supremacy and unity of government disallow a constitutionally mandated Anglo voice as much as they do an Indigenous one. If the referendum fails, that too can be attributed in part to the exclusion of Anglo advocates from the referendum process. If those advocates had been included, they might have pointed out some sensitivities on the part of the Anglo population and helped make the proposition both feasible and acceptable.